you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me in the Old Testament to the prophet Isaiah. And we'll be looking at chapter 61. And your bulletin says uh, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Um, so Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to dis to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with and for me? Jesus, we give thanks to you for the prophecies that tell us about your coming into the world. As we get ready to celebrate Christmas, Father, may we remember all the things that were said about your coming that you have fulfilled. Jesus, I pray that you would bless the reading and proclamation of your word. Speak to us, Lord, the message that you want us to hear this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if all of you have had the true adventure of a lifetime. You know what the true adventure of a lifetime is, I'm about to tell you. It is getting up early in the morning and going out into the wilderness of the shopping mall on Black Friday. <laughs> That's called an adventure of a lifetime. You wonder, am I even going to come back from this? And, and, and if you really want to go hardcore at it, you get up early. And, and I remember the days when our, our daughter Sarah was like really, really young and, and we were staying, and we would stay in Franklin at, at Lori's parents' house and Sarah would stay with them and we would get up really early, like three, four in the morning to go shopping at Toys R Us. And if you thought we were alone, no, there's all kinds of crazy people like us out there. And we're standing in line, it's like 4 o'clock in the morning, you can see your breath, it's pretty cold, and we're all kind of having fun with it, and you know, we meet people on the line, and you finally get to go into the store, and you're like, okay, you know, Lori, she came with a plan, okay, we were looking for particular items to get the deal, they don't quite do the Black Friday deals as good as they used to, but, uh, but you know, still, it's kind of neat to just look at what all they have displayed and everything, and, and if you ever wanted to know, well, what does this toy do, does it have lights or anything, you just press it, and it lights up because the batteries are already included with it. And if you really kind of want to see what toys do, you want to press something, just go to Cracker Barrel, they do the same thing. The batteries are already included in whatever they're selling. And, and this is really kind of an important point. You know, Tony Evans says, you know, this is what God says about the Holy Spirit after our salvation. Batteries are included. He said the job of the Holy Spirit is to empower the new nature to satisfy, satisfy the law of God and the demands that God has for us as His people. Batteries come included as Christians. It's called the Holy Spirit. The passage today is one of many Old Testament passages concerning the coming of the Messiah. It's saying here, when the Messiah comes, here's what it's going to look like. 
And I love how it starts. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. You know, before anything else happens, before all the cool stuff that the Messiah is going to do, before the promises of the Lord are, fu are fulfilled that the Messiah was going to bring about, before all of that is those words, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Without the Holy Spirit of God, you don't have a Messiah. Period. Yes, we can look at the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three and one. All that plays into this. But the temptation here, when we talk about this passage from Isaiah, it is to sort of skip over the opening statements and move on to the good stuff, like you know, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor and covering all who mourn beauty instead of ashes. But don't do that. The Holy Spirit of the Lord comes first for a reason. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, we read about Jesus' baptism. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John the baptizer. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and, and you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. But the Holy Spirit, I would say, is not reserved just for Jesus, or just for the apostles, either, or just for the early church, or just for a select few. No, it is for everyone. On the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, you remember how, how that day unfolded. If you read Acts, you see that there's about 120 Christian believers. They, they've seen Jesus crucified, resurrected, and he is ascended. He gave him instructions, don't leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. So they're praying in, in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them on the day of Pentecost. And it's like tongues of fire rest on all their heads, and they start speaking in tongues. And, and, and that meant that they had the ability to speak in languages that they did not know. Other people do. And, and, you know, on the day of Pentecost, it's a major Jewish festival. There are people from all over the world who have come and gathered. And so now they're hearing these disciples speaking in their own language about all the things that God has done through Jesus Christ. And they're like, what does this mean? And Peter stands up. He, sort of gives, he gives a nice sermon. And then at the end of that, it says, when people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They'd be convicted about the gospel. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. I, I'm very much aware that there is a lot of concern uh, just in the church today in general. I'm thinking about our denomination, where it's going, and all this stuff. I understand that. I get it very well. But let me be very clear. That there will... The denomination will go as it's going to go, but if it's going to turn around, it starts with the Holy Spirit. If things are going to get better in the world, and I think all of us would say that the world needs the church right now. If things are going to get better in the world, then it starts with God's people being filled with the Holy Spirit. It starts there. 
not with what legislation can be passed, whether that's at General Conference or whether that's in Washington, D.C. No, it starts with God's people being filled with the Holy Spirit of the Lord. John Wesley wrote about one of his greatest fears for the people called Methodists. He said these words. He says, I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist, either in Europe or America. But I am afraid, lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power. And this undid it. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast to both the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which they first set out. As God's people, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes we kind of hold the Holy Spirit at arm's length. We kind of don't understand all the Holy Spirit does. What is this thing about spiritual gifts and this speaking in tongues? It really sounds weird and kind of strange. I get it. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the question is, are we welcoming the Holy Spirit in and say, come Holy Spirit upon me? Or are we kind of saying, you yeah, know, that's really not for me. It's just a little weird. I'm not sure about that. Which are we? Which are we? I love the story about... Um, when a woman called her husband at work and uh, explained that, you know, he explained, said, well, I'm, I'm really, really busy. He said, you know, can, can whatever you got to say, can, can't wait till I get home. And, and the wife said, well, was, she just wanted to share some good news and a little bit of bad news, too. And the husband was really busy and needed to get off the phone. And he told his wife, well, can, can you just, just tell me the good news? She said, well, the good news is the airbags work just fine. <laughs> it's not exactly the kind of good news you want to hear, but the Messiah, Jesus, is given the Holy Spirit and is anointed for the purpose of preaching good news to the poor. The poor here is not simply a reference to people who lack financial resources. It can refer to anyone who is distressed for any reason. It is for those who are broken and beaten down by life, for those who feel like there is nothing else to live for, for those who are held captive by, by addictions with the idea of freedom seeming like a cruel dream, as one scholar said. People who think, well, the Lord could never love someone like me. I've met people who thought that. People whose dreams have been shattered and crushed. In Isaiah's passage, this is what it means to be poor. And, and he says that the Messiah has come to preach good news to the poor. The reality is that many of us know someone who's been there, who's been in those hard, dark places, or maybe who's even there now. And we probably either know someone, or maybe we are that someone. Maybe we, we put on the good face, oh, things are good, things are fine, but it, deep inside, maybe they're not. Jesus comes to preach good news to the poor. The, the text is structured in, in ways that, well, what is preaching good news to the poor? It's not throwing out just some kind words and saying, oh, it, it'll, it'll be all right, it'll, it'll all be good. No. What is preaching good news to the poor is the rest of verses 1 through 3. Preaching good news to the poor is, you know, what he said, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Preaching good news to the poor is proclaiming freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Pre preaching good news to the poor is proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Preaching good news to the poor is comforting all who mourn. It is giving beauty for ashes and so forth. You know, the prophet speaks of binding up the brokenhearted 
The Hebrew word there is habas or hebas. And it refers to an open wound that is oozing out. You see the same word in the first chapter of Isaiah, verse 6, says, From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts. That hebas, wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. But yet the Messiah says he will bandage, bandage up the brokenhearted. God will heal the wounds of the soul and of the heart. Blood desires to make us whole, to bind us up where we are broken. The Messiah proclaims freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. The Israelites, they knew full well what captivity was like. You think of the people who would be hearing Isaiah's prophecies. They were living in a foreign land. They had broken the covenant of the Lord. And because of that, God removed his hedge of protection from them. And the Israelites were a defeated people. They had been hauled into exile to live in Babylon, which is now modern day Iraq. And they lived as a people who had no hope. In their minds, being the chosen people of God, being a part of the kingdom that God had promised, that was over and done. And yet God says, I will raise up a righteous branch from King David's tree. I am going to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? The Apostle Paul says, all who sin are slaves to sin. And yet we have been bought with a price. We are free from the bondage of sin. It is important to understand what that means. It means that not only are we free from the consequences of our sins, but sin itself doesn't have to have a hold on us anymore. We don't have to engage in it. We don't have to live in it. And that is the call of Christ. The deliverance that Christ offers is not just, oh, let me take away the pain or the consequences of sin. It's saying, let me give you a life apart from it so you don't have to stay in it anymore. It's called holiness. It is hope. If we are sinners, then what we deserve is the wrath of the Lord. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let's be clear on that. But if we hope in Jesus, Jesus gives us this hope that you know, through Him we can be redeemed. Through Him we experience the love of God. He takes away all the fear. Through Jesus, He says, I can bring you out of the mud, the muck, and the mire, and all the junk in this world. I can deliver you from it. The deliverance of the Lord. <clears throat> Preaching good news to the poor is proclaimed is when the Messiah proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. Again, we're talking about a defeated people. The promises of God are gone. And they're saying it's over. There is no hope. Will God really choose to bless us again? Would be the mindset of the Israelites in that day. There are those in our community who have convinced themselves that they are too far gone for God to love them. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus said, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. If you or me or anyone else repents, there is rejoicing for you. Angels rejoice for you. When we come to the Lord and say, God, I give all of myself to good, the bad, the ugly, the messed up, the very everything I lay it here before you, if you can do anything with me, please do so. When we completely surrender, angels rejoice over you. Angels rejoice for you. A 
I love the the imagery where it says beauty for ashes. He gives a crown of beauty instead of ashes. There are those who look at their wives and they see ashes. For one reason or another, or no reason at all, other than we live in a fallen world where accidents happen, where things go wrong, where our lives get turned upside down, where disaster happens. And God says, come to me in complete surrender and I will take the ashes and give you a crown of beauty. Ashes symbolize death. And God says, I will give you life. Ashes represent the end. And God says, I will give you a new beginning. These are the things the Messiah does. These are the things that Jesus does. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus has returned to Galilee and says, In the power of the Spirit, the news about Jesus spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised Him. And then it says this, He went to Nazareth, where He had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day He went into the synagogue, as was His custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, unrolling it. He found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled the scroll back up, gave it to an attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The Messiah has come. His name is Jesus. And in essence, where we are broken, he can make us whole. Where we feel like our lives are nothing but ashes, we say, Oh no. Oh no. I can make I can take that and make something of great beauty out of it. Whatever it is that we are struggling with today, know this. God gives his Holy Spirit to us to empower us to do the work of the kingdom. And ultimately, Jesus is the head of the church. He is the one who reigns. And if we will follow his lead, if we will cling to him in complete surrender. In other words, we don't come with, oh Jesus, I'll follow you, but hey, I, I want to do this or I want to do that. No, no, no. Is we give up the rights to ourselves. And if we will do that, I believe he will give all of us <coughs> crowns of beauty for ash. He will deliver us from whatever is holding us back. At the end of the passage, there in Isaiah 61, verse 3, it says, And these people will be oaks of righteousness. Yeah, I'm not a big tree person. I don't know my different trees. Um, Sarah had a tree project, a leaf project. She had to get leaves from all these trees. I'm like, I don't know. It's got a trunk, it's got leaves on it, it's a tree. You know, that's about as much about trees as I know. Um, but I know oaks are strong trees. Oaks of righteousness. I believe the world needs some oaks of righteousness today. And God's calling you and I to be those oaks. It's not something that we can pass off to someone else. We can just say, oh, well, that's for somebody else to be. No, it's, it's our call. Will we choose to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Will we say, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Lord our God. We will say, we will fix our eyes on Him, and wherever He leads, we will follow. 
Will we be oaks of righteousness because we are far more committed to Jesus than anything else in this world? That's how we change the world. That's it. My prayer is that that will be who we are here in this congregation and beyond. Let's pray. Jesus, make us oaks of righteousness by your power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would speak to our souls, Lord. I pray that your love and grace would be showered upon us. God, where we have put conditions on following you, Father, help us to give those up. To be totally committed to you, to radically abandon everything else in the world. May we have our eyes fixed by you. Father, where we are hurting, where we are wounded by the sun, where we are captive, set us free, Lord. Where we see ashes, give us beauty. We ask it in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.